That damn Sarah Hatley is dangerous. She's been dowsing for dead animals ever since the last of the winter snow melted. The Hatley girl's always carrying that same crooked bit of willow branch. Sarah holds it out in front of her, and she closes her eyes, then she makes faces like she's detecting something invisible in the air. She calls it her sensing stick. I've seen her digging things up, too. She's telling everyone who asks that she can make these little corpses feel better again. I'll admit that I've noticed a strange abundance of squirrels and blue jays in the parklands this year. Maybe that's just an eerie coincidence, though. The recent winter's snowfall in Ashland was also irregularly heavy. Sometimes things are related, and sometimes they aren't. Speaking of things that might or might not be connected, almost a dozen people went missing this winter. Not a single one of them has returned. To Ashland or otherwise been found. The police are starting to think these incidents might all be related. In the papers, it's been theorized that a single unknown assailant might be living here in town. They started calling this unknown person the Ashland Flare. No official leads on a suspect yet, though. That's even despite all the odd body parts they've been turning up around town. It's ugly business, to be sure. Sarah's 19 with the mind of an 11-year-old. Physically, she's more like a young man. Girl's nearly 6 feet tall and broad in the shoulders. She's not just big, she's got muscles all over her body. I I've caught Sarah on my property a few times now. Each time I'm afraid to have her anywhere near me. She climbs the chain link to let herself into my backyard without my permission. I had to chase her off every time she's done it. Her dowsing rod keeps bringing her back. I don't keep pets. I never did. I've told her that several times now, but she doesn't seem to believe me. Neighborhood kids have started saving up their lunch money and allowances to hire Sarah. They wanted to bring back their dead pets. She's more than happy to accept all the pocket change and crumpled up bills they managed to bring her. Parents have started to worry, and I've decided to start being more vocal about my own concerns. It's felt good to share my anxiety with others in the community. There's, there's no question that Sarah Hatley will keep stirring up trouble in Ashland if she hasn't done so already. Now she'll soon go too far. Kids have started sneaking out after night. Even stranger, there's stories about pets coming back. Parents shrug it off mostly. Mundane explanations are quickly found because the only alternative is to believe Sarah's claims. It's not the same dog, they say. It's just that an oddly similar animal has wandered into town. Coincidences like that seem harmless enough at first. I've seen a few families chasing away animals too. The father shouts and brandishes some makeshift weapon while standing in the driveway and the mother waits nearby until the animal's out of sight. Usually she's trying to convince her crying child that it isn't their dog that's being chased off. It's hard to tell how much Sarah understands because she's developmentally delayed. She could be a killer. Certainly true. Wouldn't take a wild stretch of imagination to think of her bludgeoning or stabbing a man to death. She's a remarkably strong girl. Sarah might easily fill the role of the Ashland Flayer. Only missing piece is a demon in her heart. In my opinion, that's what makes someone lash out to kill a stranger. When you look at a person from the outside, there's no way to tell whether the demon's there. I heard rustling outside my window last night. I retrieved my gun before heading to investigate. Clicked on the porch light as I stepped outside. At the periphery of the illuminated area, I found Sarah Hatley creeping near the side of the house. She looked dazed in my direction. As I leveled my rifle to her. Damn girl, I hissed loudly. Trespassing! Maybe it took her eyes a moment to adjust to the flood of light that I had brought outside with me. When she recognized the firearm I carried, Sarah's face changed briefly to an expression of obvious anxiety. There's dead animals buried here, she stuttered out. Her face returned to tranquil blankness as I lowered my gun, but a trace of fear remained. That damn stupid dowsing rod of hers was still pointed in the direction of my house the tip of the branch wavering gently in the air as Sarah's hands began to tremble. I could tell she was still thinking about how she had risked getting shot. I don't keep any pets, I told her yet again. I never have. I shouldered my rifle as though I was ready to drive Sarah off my property by force. She made the same anxious face as before. I don't want to see you here ever again, I growled. Awful sorry, mister, she responded. But there's dead critters here. They want healing. 
Looking crestfallen, she turned and started walking in the direction of her own house. I kept my gun in hand and the porch light on as I watched her leave. Sarah lifted herself over the chain link fence at the border of my property and continued walking in the darkness until I couldn't see her no longer. Maybe I overreacted, but, but could you blame me? The local newspapers published another story about the Ashland Flare this morning. The Flare's been connected to another disappearance that happened on the late nights of New Year's Eve. The police claim that they, they're narrowing their list of suspects, but they haven't arrested anyone yet. That's got me feeling scared. The last thing I need now are random townsfolk skulking around on my property. If I let my guard down, I'm risking my own neck. I suppose that's true for anyone, isn't it? One of the strange dogs that's supposed to have been healed by Sarah caused some serious trouble today. Went berserk. Started biting the kid that paid Sarah to bring his old dog back. By the sound of it, the kid took some really nasty bites. He's basically mauled. Finally, the people of Ashland are starting to organize against the weirdo clan of Hatleys. Mother and father are just as odd as Sarah is. Maybe they're afraid of their own daughter. That'd be why they never speak up about her behavior. The boy that was mauled returned from the hospital today. Wore some fresh stitches on his neck. Down near the collarbone where the teeth had gone in. He's claiming that it's his own fault that the dog bit him. He says that Sarah didn't do anything wrong. Apparently he did something that used to bother his dog before it died. Did it to test whether his new dog was really the same one he buried last summer. He says that he's certain now that the creature that bit his throat open can only be the revived body of his old dog. That irrational fool of a boy says that he still loves his childhood pet. Some people from the town went out to confront the Hatleys last night. I was among them. Sarah's parents were shy and didn't seem to take our anger seriously. They meekly defended their daughter. They proclaimed that their family was innocent on all counts. Father claimed instead that the evil happening around Ashland must be coming from somewhere else. The Hatley mother even dared to whisper that there was something particularly strange about my own property. I spat in anger to hear it. Then I loudly called the whole family devil worshippers. I said it right into their faces. I did not grant any of them a single batted eye, a doubt or sympathy while the family denied it. The town was mostly on my side by the end of it. We had decided by now that the Hatleys were no good. The police continued to provide no real answers about the disappearances that occurred over this past winter. It's become something of a nightly routine for many people in Ashland to carefully check their surroundings before bed. Some from the community like to watch their yards from behind the barely parted blinds that obscure their upstairs windows. Other people are brave enough to step out onto the sidewalks near the homes to talk with their neighbors. And eventually, we all go inside to lock up extra security as the dusk wanes tonight. I've started to complain more openly about that damn Sarah Hatley. I think she's the source of all this trouble. That's what I tell the parents of those children who ask for $5 or $10 to give the Hatley girl. They want their dead pets back. She's playing along with a perverted sort of glee in order to keep pocketing their money. She's just a girl, some of them respond. Sarah's a grown woman, stronger than some men, I tell them. My correction of this detail is stern enough to make most people's eyes flit nervously away from me. No one wants to look me in the eye because I'm saying things that disturb them. She's strong, she's strange enough to drive a knife into someone who doesn't suspect it, I declared aloud more than once. And she's sneaky enough to find people who would make good targets. It was a Saturday morning when Sarah Hadley finally went too far. She found something in the town square that Ashland police had completely failed to notice. I was one of the first people to gather around her as Sarah started prying up one of the cement pavers that were there in the public promenade. She looked to be keen on reviving a section of soil that was hidden underneath. Reaching down into the dirt with her bare hands, Sarah quickly uncovered the the rigor-stiffened arm of a corpse. It had been buried only inches beneath the surface of the ground. Killer had covered the body with little more than a dusting of dirt, and then simply crunched the heavy cement paper back on top of the shallow grave that had now been made there. Now Sarah was gripping the corpse by his exposed wrist. She was heaving with all of her strength to bring more of the body up and out of the ground. Those of us who were standing there when Sarah begged her to stop Police will be there soon, we told her. You don't need to touch the body anymore. Sarah kept digging, though. 
She was prying at the caked on dirt with her fingertips to reveal more of the corpse. Soon escalated, became even worse than thought. No, it soon escalated, became even worse than that, though. Repeatedly, she drew her nose and mouth disgustingly close to the putrefied flesh. Was she smelling it? No, it was even worse than that. Each time that Sarah's face went near the arm, she, I could see that she was leaving tooth marks behind. Damn girl's biting the body, I screamed in pure revulsion. She's tasting it! The accusation was enough to draw Sarah out of her reverie. She looked up to all of us who were gathered there around her. With a look of fear on her face, she glowered toothily at us and revealed that there were indeed gritty bits of rotten skin stuck in and around her mouth, solidified blood stained to the crooked angles beneath her teeth. The saliva from her tongue rehydrated some of the congealed mess, returning it to something like fresh blood flow. The liquefied red trickled down in rivulets from the pouting corners of Sarah's mouth. It's a misunderstanding, she wailed. I found this fella down here, but I didn't do nothing to him. She let out a scream of frustration. He just needs waking up. I need to wake him up now or he won't get another chance. He wants to get up here along with the rest of us. He's begging me to help wake him up. Sarah brought her voice down into something like an unintangible sobbing and remained sitting by the corpse that she had unearthed. She sat there until the police arrived. They put Sarah into a holding cell down at the county jail. They brought the remains of the corpse to the morgue. It'd take a few days for the body to be identified properly. I reckon that we'll, we'll learn a lot more in the coming days, but it's already gotten to that point where the community of Ashland seemed to have come to a final consensus. The Hatleys are going to be forced out of town. We'll drive them out with weapons, actual bloodshed if it has to come to that. Even the local police and churches seem ready to stand aside, let us take matters into our own hands. I suspect the newspapers won't breathe a word, for all ultimately forced to kill him. We'd all be criminally complicit, just for defending ourselves in our homes. What sense is there in airing an honest town's dirty laundry like that? Sarah's back out of jail on a pathetically small bail amount. It was made clear to her that we mainly just never want to see her face again. The Hatleys are packing up everything in their house. They'll be on the road soon enough. I don't know exactly how much of a direct role I've played in purging that clan from my beloved Ashland. But I'm glad at least to see that they're finally almost gone. It's undeniable relief. But I wonder whether this could really be the end of my restless nights. Am I finally safe? And look, you and I are strangers. And I'm confident that we'll never meet. For this reason, I at least admit this to you. I'm the one they call the Ashland Flare. The remains of no fewer than 30 victims are buried in the cellar beneath my house. I work in the winter to stifle the smell, but springtime I've cleaned and preserved all the trophies I care to keep. I hope for their own sake the Hatley family never tries to come back to Ashland. If Sarah Hatley douses her way back onto my property, she's going to find a lot more than she ever bargained for. I've never been one much for superstition. I like to think of myself as a very rational person. In fact, I take pride in that mindset. I'm the sort of person who doesn't really put much stock in things that they haven't seen or experienced. At least not firsthand. I don't believe in ghosts. I don't believe in demons, supernatural creatures, or anything of that sort, really. The concept of faith or belief in some sort of god is much the same. That's why I don't bother praying. If except to the fact that there's no such thing as miracles, there's nothing out there in the world that can save me, not from... Not from whatever this is. Let me start from the beginning. It was maybe about a week ago now. It's hard to remember sometimes. But with the way things start to blend together. I was going through my junk mail this morning. Tearing open each and every envelope, examining the contents, and shredding anything that looked like it had any sort of personal information on it. 
Probably a bit excessive going that far for junk mail, but I've always been paranoid about that sort of thing. Looking back now, I'm not sure if I regret being that paranoid, or if I wish I'd been more paranoid in a different way. Not like it matters much at this point, anyway. The envelope it came in wasn't anything particularly remarkable. It's pretty much your typical credit card-related junk mail. You know the type. Company logo plastered tastefully all over it. Address carefully printed behind a plastic window. Usual stuff. It was even from a familiar company. There was nothing outwardly wrong about it and to indicate that it wasn't just another piece of dull junk mail. Though after seeing the contents, I had a hard time believing that it had actually come from the company it said it did. You would usually expect the letter inside to be some sort of long-winded spiel, right? Some nonsense about their amazing offer that you're just so very lucky to have qualified for. This one... This one had none of that, though. Heck, it didn't even have any sort of words. It was just a single piece of folded up paper. It was blank on one side and completely covered with strange symbols on the other. Hard to describe exactly what they looked like. They didn't exactly have any sort of uniform pattern, or at least not one I could discern. The way it combined both strangely swirling lines and edges, so sharp they seemed like they could cut, made me distinctly unsettled. I couldn't manage to look at it for very long without my head starting to ache. I didn't shred it. For whatever reason, I felt compelled to take it over to my kitchen sink and burn it. I still didn't understand why I did that, thinking about it now. Maybe seeing that paper triggered something instinctual in the back of my mind, something in my subconscious that told me that there was something incredibly wrong about those symbols. They were, they were like dark clouds on the horizon, and perhaps if I... If I were able to be rid of them, the storm may not end up actually coming. It didn't work. That night I had a nightmare. It caught me off guard as I usually don't have any dreams whatsoever. Obviously it wasn't all that bad though. I'd never had it happen to me before, but it appeared to be a pretty standard bout of sleep paralysis. I simply awoke in the middle of the night in my room, unable to move. I laid there motionless for a while with the vague sense of predatory gaze watching me from a distance. I woke up that morning shivering in a cold sweat, unused to the experience of a nightmare. It was, it was terrifying. But I didn't think too much on it at first. That is until I had the exact same dream the next night. Only this time I wasn't alone in my room. As I laid there, paralyzed and fearful, I became aware of a presence. It was this great, looming figure that seemed to hover directly over me. It was so massive and imposing that it didn't seem possible for it to be contained within the confines of my bedroom, yet there it was all the same. The predatory gaze was now clearly coming from this figure. It was so focused and intense. It felt like it might pierce right through me. It was less like being stared at, more like the barrel of a rifle was being shoved down my throat. I nearly choked on my fear. The worst part of it, though, was that it seemed to be getting closer. It moved forward inch by inch. Still not quite visible, but growing ever closer in moments that sounded like the creaking of rotten wood. It wasn't until two nights later that I could fully see it took the form of a humongous spider about the size of a, of a fighter jet. I say it was a spider, but it wasn't exactly made out of the usual parts, though. Its body was like a bundle of giant grapes in the vague shape of a spider's body, except for instead of grapes, it was made of huge bloodshot eyeballs. The otherworldly body was supported by eight spindly limbs, each crafted haphazardly from countless human bones. There was one eye, much larger than the rest, which seemed to serve in the place of a head. Other than the size, there was, there was one other glaring feature that set it apart from others. A set of gaping jaws that split the eye across the middle, staring at me with, with every single one of its countless eyes. It almost, it almost seemed to smile as it drew closer. In doing so, it revealed a set of pearly white fangs, seemingly made of human fingers and bones. Needless to say, the dreams absolutely terrified me. It wasn't just their contents that was so frightening to me, though. 
although that was plenty enough on its own. What scared me the most was how real they seemed. So much so that I could barely distinguish them from reality. I knew that they weren't real. I was certain of it. No matter how terrifying that creature was, it couldn't actually hurt me. At least, at least that's what I believed until a few nights ago. The night it finally touched me. At this point, its head seemed to loom just a few feet above my own so close that the ends of its limbs weren't even visible anymore. From the moment I entered the dream that night, I could somehow tell things were different. I could sense a sort of tension in the air, like an, like an audience watched with bated breath. The spider's eyes stared at me, and, as always, it was somehow different in a way I couldn't quite describe. The, the surface of an eyeball could hardly make very many expressions, so I couldn't easily discern the thing's mood. I knew it well enough, though. After countless nights of unwillingly locking eyes, I knew that it was far from normal. It was then that the creature shifted. I couldn't quite tell what was happening at first until I finally saw one of its bony limbs reaching in from the side. I was surprised to find that at the end of this particular limb wasn't a claw like it had imagined, but a normal-sized human hand, with the bones of a human hand at least. It reached down to my side, it took tight hold of my wrist, and it started to pull it upwards. I tried to resist, of course, but I knew it would be futile. I was just as incapable of movement as I had been every other night. My muscles refused to cooperate with me. It pulled my hand closer to its head, and the main eye followed it as it went. Gently, almost lovingly, the creature forced me to stroke it. I told myself over and over and over again it wasn't real. However, I couldn't deny the slimy sensation on my hand. It, it may not have been real, but it certainly felt real. The gaze of the main eye turned back to me, and somehow, in that moment, I knew. It was enjoying this. Relishing in every moment of my drawn-out disgust and fear. I could see, carried in the wide grin that split its head in two, pleasure, almost pure ecstasy derived from my torment, and then it, then it bit down hard on my index finger again and again and again and again and I woke up screaming, the pain still shooting up my arm, stabbing my brain with needles of anguish, if you could, if you can imagine what it might have felt like to attempt to cut off one of your fingers with a pair of very dull scissors, you have a pretty good idea of what that experience is like. Hyperventilating, I repeated to myself over and over in my head that the that mantra that brought me so much comfort over the past few nights, it isn't real, it's just a bad dream, it isn't real, it's just a bad dream, it isn't real, it's just a bad dream. And I almost convinced myself to believe it too. That is until I looked down at my hand and saw the ragged, bloody stump where my finger used to be. It's been a few nights since then. I've managed to keep from falling asleep again for now, but I know I can only last for so much longer. Even now, as I type this, I can feel my mind growing sluggish as I begin to nod off. It's only, it's only a matter of time now. I'm scared. Not of it killing me. No, somehow I know that won't, that won't happen. It won't kill me this time. Or even the time after that, it's enjoying itself too much. It's going to drag this out for as long as possible, saving every moment of my agony before it finally decides to allow me to die. I'm not going to, to give it the satisfaction, though, in truth, considering the alternative. The gun I have sitting on the desk next to my computer definitely seems like the better option. I mean... I am a very rational person, after all. Our little Philip had complained about his nightmares for weeks. Lisa suggested we take him to a doctor. I resisted. I had nightmares when I was his age. Awful ones. Ones that, well, to this day, I still shudder to recall. It seemed poor Philip was more like his old man than his mom and I had hoped. After a particularly wretched night of his howling and shrieking, I caved. I couldn't bear to see my son suffer from terrors he was too young to understand. Talk about a waste of time. Sometimes kids have overactive imaginations, the pediatrician assured us. I know it's hard for you guys. 
My Natalie had some pretty bad ones after she saw something on TV she shouldn't have, but it passed. Absent any trauma in his life, and I don't think Philip endured any, I don't think your son could be any different. Thanks, Doc. Here's your $65 copay. We returned home, and our days went by as they had been. Our son would be kind, loving, and innocent during the day, and once it got dark, he'd grow sullen, brooding. You can even apply that adjective to a four-year-old. It was like he knew it was only a matter of time before terrible things would happen. The other night, Lisa rushed to his room around 3.15 a.m. to attend to his screaming. It was her turn. I waited in the blackness for everything to quiet down and for my wife to return to bed. Only this time, it was different. Philip's screaming didn't stop. In fact, it only intensified. It was because his mother's screams had joined his own. I bolted out of bed and galloped down the hall to my son's room. The overhead light was on, and my eyes hadn't acclimated to the brightness. Everything was blurred and confusing for a few dreaded seconds. But things came into focus. I saw Lisa clutching Philip to her chest. He looked different. My breath caught in my throat. My son's dark hair was bright, silvery gray. The contrast was shocking against Lisa's dark nightgown. What happened? I gasped, and I rushed to join them. He was just like this, Lisa sobbed. We need to go to the hospital. I didn't argue. We carried Philip down the stairs, got in the car, and left. The doctors were baffled. The nurses were disturbed. We were horrified, and Philip... Philip just didn't understand. That was the hardest part for us. The nightmares were bad enough, but at least they were finite. They ended when the sun came up, but here, in the hospital... It was a whole new level of fear for my son. Lisa and I couldn't hold him when he was being tested by any army of confused doctors and fascinated medical students. Philip just sat and sobbed. His eyes never left ours. If he understood the concept of betrayal, I'm certain he felt like his parents had betrayed him by not taking him out of that place. Hours dragged by. Physically, there was nothing wrong with our boy. The so-called experts couldn't tell us what had happened to him. At the end of all the examinations, and the end of all the poking and prodding and speculation, all they could recommend was a sleep study. When there were left for Lisa and I to turn to, we agreed. We took Philip home, did our best to help him feel safe and comfortable. I was hoping he'd be able to get some sleep, he seemed so exhausted, and it was only, only exacerbated by the gray hair. He looked like a tired, frightened old man. No luck. The stress of the incident only served to keep our boy awake. Lisa told me it was probably a good thing since he'd, he'd have to be asleep for the test that night. I knew she was right, but his wide-eyed expression of horror was almost too much to bear. Last night at nine, we headed back to the hospital for the sleep study. The sight of our beautiful son with that awful array of wires and probes brought me to tears. Philip, of course was confused and frightened, but we could tell that he was profoundly tired. The few words he spoke were slurred and his eyelids had started to droop. Lisa held his hand until he drifted off to sleep sometime around 11. I stayed in the control room with the two doctors, who watched the probe readouts. I don't expect we'll see anything until he reaches REM sleep, he told me. I eyed the digital display of Philip's brainwaves. That's my... That's my son, I thought to myself. That's... that's everything he is. Seeing the calm, lazy lines and the uninterested expressions of the doctors gave me a shred of hope. Nothing was wrong. Lisa joined us in the control room as we chatted idly with the doctors about nothing in particular. An hour went by. I started feeling like I might be drifting off when on the other side of the one-way mirror, I saw Philip twitch. My view darted to the readout. Spikes were forming in the brainwave activity. He's entering REM sleep, a doctor announced. He resumed talking to Lisa, still showing no indication that anything might be amiss. I leaned back in the chair and slept for a few minutes. I don't know exactly what it was, but... I think the change of tone in the background conversation caused me to wake up. 
The doctors were no longer talking with Lisa. They sat huddled around the monitors. The brainwave spikes were pronounced and erratic. On the other side of the glass, Philip began to scream. I jumped to my feet and collided with Lisa as we tried to enter the room where my son slept. No, no, instructed the doctor. Let him sleep. We need to get a good sampling of his brain activity. Grudgingly, my wife and I agreed, and we held one another as we stared at Philip thrashing and screaming on the bed. The doctors were saying things to one another we didn't understand. Medical jargon. They appeared far more interested than they had been before, however. I had been using their reactions to gauge how nervous I should be as Philip's nightmare went on. Seeing their eyes widen as they studied the monitor made me very nervous indeed. After five straight minutes of screaming and sobbing, Philip went silent. I let out a sigh of relief. He opened his eyes. I wondered if the test was over. He's awake. Can I go see him? Lisa asked. No. He isn't awake, one of the doctors replied. The instruments are still registering REM sleep. Oh God, I thought. I just want this to be over. Look at that, the doctor said, and pointed at something on the screen of his colleague. What is... We started. Then all four of us gazed at Philip through the glass. His mouth started to open as if he was ready to start screaming again, except this time he remained silent. I saw his chest dip like he was taking a deep breath. The waves on screen spiked wildly. Philip's mouth opened wider and wider. Lisa's scream of fear accompanied an audible pop as my son's jaw broke. Both doctors rushed into the room followed by Lisa. I couldn't move. I... I just seen something in the waveforms of the monitor. Lisa and the doctors tried to rouse my son while I stared with disbelief at the screen. In a scramble of spikes on the monitor, there was a shape. It was changing and shifting and fading in and out of the chaotic lines of brainwaves, but it formed something unmistakable. A hideous growling face. Every seat has been filled. The aisles are empty. We've boarded and taken off, all while a nervous-looking man stands mysteriously at the back of the plane. No one seems to notice him. I do. He was already on board when I sat down in my row at the end of the aisle. Dressed casually, he carried himself with a sullen anxiety that I, I found unsettling. I hate flying, I always have, but still, this felt different. I gave him a once-over, he looked normal enough, I found no reason to be worried, yet his presence perturbed me. I shrugged it off. There wasn't much I could do. I tried to relax. My mind wandered, I found myself casually daydreaming about his identity. I imagined that he was a... Um, middling cop, nervous about transporting a dangerous criminal. Then he became a, a repentant lover who had broken through security to proclaim his desire to an ex. Maybe he was a, a disgruntled former employee waiting to take his vengeance. As the plane filled and the man took no further action, though, my interest waned. I was tired with worry and already sick of the long flight ahead. His presence drained from my mind and I rested my head against the curved innards of the aircraft daydreamed instead about nothing at all. At the sound of takeoff, however, my posture straightened and his blotted shape tilted back in the corner of my eye. I felt compelled to look over. There he was, still, with a manner slightly less sullen but precisely more anxious, standing opposite the bathroom door, staring down the aisle. No crew member came to seat him. I double-checked the seatbelt sign. On. I glared back over at my two roommates. They didn't seem to notice. Weird. I coyly nudged the armrest of my neighbor, an elderly woman, who had been reading the in-flight brochure. She kindly looked up and over at me. I gave a friendly smile and silently gestured towards the man standing just behind us. She smiled back, oblivious, and elbowed the old man sitting next to her, who leaned forward slightly, and donated a half-hearted head nod. Suddenly, the plane lurched forward. We were thrust back into our seats. I straightened up, slightly unnerved. I could see the man out of the corner of my eye. He didn't move. I raised the blinder on the window next to me. 
The world outside sped up to a blur. I sat upright and popped my head over the seat, looking for a crew member. I saw a stewardess near the middle of the plane, sitting comfortably by the emergency exit door, facing towards us. She didn't seem to notice the standing man. I glanced out the window. The runway began to shrink away below us. Still, the man stood. Weird. When the seatbelt sign blinked off, I quickly unfastened. I excused myself to the elderly couple and stepped out into the aisle. I was curious. Should I say something to the man, to the crew, to another passenger? Perhaps he was, perhaps he was an air marshal. But weren't they supposed to blend in? The man wore plain clothes but stood out as everyone sat, not exactly conspicuous. Maybe he was some kind of inspector for the airline, maybe for the government. Uh, are you waiting for the bathroom? I asked. He was about my height, though he was slouched slightly against the wall. He had been staring down the aisle, off into the distance, but abruptly glanced my way when I questioned him. I held my breath in anticipation, only to receive a dismissive head shake. He turned back around and resettled into his distant stare. That was disappointing, I thought. Maybe the daydreams has heightened my expectations. I opened the bathroom door and slunk inside. I was feeling woozy. I splashed some water on my face and stared at my reflection in the mirror. I didn't look great, but that wasn't unusual. I shook my head and walked back out. The man was still standing there, staring down the aisle. A small three-person procession had also formed in the space just outside the bathroom. I slipped out as an elderly woman slipped in. The two older men behind her shambled forward. One met my eyes and gave a polite smile, which I returned. The other had his head down. Neither seemed to acknowledge the standing man. I wondered if they'd question him as well. I excused myself to the elderly couple in my row and shuffled back down into my window seat. The man still stood just behind us, transfixed by some distant point. No sense of threat seemed to emanate from him, though, and I was... I was exhausted. So I slunk down in my chair, closed my eyes, and dozed off. I dreamt of a beautiful summer day in a quiet little town. I walked along the street, alone but content. Fine two-story brick homes with shingled roofs washed up and down my left side like angular waves in a long, endless park slithered brightly along to my right. There were no cars on the road, parked or moving, but every other house had a vehicle or two stationed in the driveway. The park was empty, too, though there were a few half-dozen or so red and white balloons tied to a bench which just sat off the sidewalk opposite to me, beside a big oak tree. As I walked forward, I saw that these shoes were connected to a pair of clean, gray dress pants, and as I walked further still, I saw that a torso draped in a pale blue button shirt jutted out from the top of these pants. A rotund gut concealed any further viewing, but it heaved and hooed as, as to suggest that a head might rest on the other side. Curious, I crossed the street and made my way towards the body. As I approached, the belly began to breathe in heavier exaggerations, till I stood directly over a throbbing mass of clothing. I looked down for a face, but no head appeared. Instead, a framed mirror weighed down the collar of an empty button-up shirt, which now expanded and deflated so intensely that I thought it might explode. I looked into the mirror and I saw my own reflection, and then someone else's. I jumped and I spun around, no one was there. I looked up, no one. I looked back down. A root from the big oak tree had curled around the mirror's frame and slithered its way into the shirt. The two pulsed in rhythm with each other. A strong breeze blew. The big oak tree creaked loudly and swayed in the wind until it looked like it might fall over. Panicked, I gripped the root, woven into the shirt, and pulled at it with all of my might. I gently awoke. 
My left elbow tingled and my hands were numb. I rose up to my seat and gave my arm a shake. I looked around. The food cart sauntered forward a few rows up. The elderly lady next to me was reading. Her husband appeared to be asleep. I had to go to the bathroom. I excused myself to my neighbor and carefully pirouetted past her sleeping companion. Still groggy, I shook my head, wiped my brow, and looked up. Right into the eyes of the standing man. I froze. His eyes were huge, like that of a child, but his face was worn and weathered, and thin strands of pale brown hair fell upon his forehead. He stared right through my soul, more sorrowful than ever, but less anxious than before. He didn't speak. I couldn't speak. I stumbled backwards a little bit, but caught myself on the edge of a seat. I felt shell-shocked. I tried to gather myself, but as I stood up, a heavy, cold force blasted into my backside, hurling me forward. I was barely able to contort my body enough to avoid the man standing in front of me. My back rammed against the bathroom door, and I froze like a prisoner caught in a spotlight. Oh my god, I heard from the aisle. I'm so sorry, I turned. The food cart, manned by a distressed-looking stewardess, rattled in the walkway. I didn't see you. I'm so sorry. I only looked down for a second, she pleaded. It's all right. I stammered, as I straightened up and tried to compose myself. I wasn't paying attention. It's my fault. The stewardess furrowed her brow and squinted her eyes. You all right? She asked. Everything but my pride, I responded, dryly. I was shaken up inside, but I didn't want to make a fuss. I composed my outward appearance. I turned to the standing man, contemplating whether or not I should even bother apologizing for the ruckus. He seemed indifferent to the whole situation. He looked... Ill. Did the stewardess notice? Why didn't she or anyone else try to seat him during takeoff? He must have some sort of authority, but he appeared so, so fragile, sickly. I looked back at the flight attendant to gauge her interest. She didn't seem alarmed. Excuse me, she said politely, as she began to slowly push the food cart again. I need to get by. I gave my head a shake. I opened up the bathroom door and slunk away inside. I felt panicked. If the man was sick, he should get help. Someone must have already approached him, though. It's not like he was hiding. The stewardess didn't seem concerned at all. Everything must be under control. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling of impending doom. I wasn't sure what to do. I looked in the mirror to calm myself, but didn't like what I saw. I turned towards the inside of the bathroom door and lay my forehead against it. I put my face in my hands and tried to gather myself. What was I getting so worked up over? Was I getting sick? Was I going crazy? Maybe I'm just hungry. When did I last eat? I strained to remember. The only memory of food that I could resuscitate on the spot was from a meal that had taken place at least a few nights earlier. My eyes began to well up as I thought about that dinner. Maybe I was becoming feverish. I rubbed my cheeks. My wife and I had made roast beef and Yorkshire pudding that night. It was an old family recipe. My parents used to make it for my brothers and I growing up. We made it for our own kids now. My parents had passed away years ago. God, I miss them. I couldn't wait for this godforsaken plane ride to be over so I could see my family again. I was getting flustered. I just needed to eat, I told myself. That special dinner was plentiful, but even something as tender and delicious as a good roast beef can't last a man a lifetime. I resolved to hunt down the food cart that had assaulted me earlier and plunder it with a vengeance. I tossed some water on my face, took a deep breath, and stepped out of the bathroom. I don't know what I was expecting, but there he was. The mystery man, just standing there. I need to ask about him, too, I thought, for my own sake. He was in the same place as he has been this whole flight, staring off into the distance. I eyed him cautiously as I searched for the stewardess in the back. She wasn't there. I turned and gazed off into the distance and saw her chatting with a fellow crew member closer to the front of the plane. I took off after them. I passed through a mostly silent field of passengers. Nearly everyone was lost in their own little world. People were sleeping, reading, watching in-flight entertainment. Very few were talking. 
There was a hushed air about the cabin. Most seemed to be traveling alone. I noticed that the majority of the plane's population were elderly. Three or four middle-aged individuals stood out, as did a few unaccompanied youths. A cloth-wrapped infant was being rocked to sleep by a young woman in an aisle seat, and three very young men, outfitted in army attire, quietly joked about near the emergency exits. The rest of the plane, however, was decidedly more aged and reserved. Was I headed to Florida? I genuinely couldn't remember. Can I help you? The two flight attendants suddenly stood before me. Uh, yeah, sorry, I stammered, jolted out of my inquisitive reverie. Is it too late to order some food? I asked, feeling a little faint. It is, unfortunately, answered the stewardess. We're about to make our descent. I was surprised. For some reason, I had expected a lengthier flight. Maybe I had slept for longer than I realized. You should return to your seat, she smiled. The seatbelt sign will be turning on momentarily. All right, I yielded. I turned around and looked down the aisle. The standing man stared back. Um, actually, can I ask you a question? I said, turning back around. Yes, sir, responded the stewardess politely. I wasn't exactly sure what to say or how to put it. I gathered myself once again. Well, um, do you, do you see that man standing outside the bathroom? I asked, pointing back up the aisle toward him. I immediately regretted my approach. What if I was actually going crazy? What if I had a fever and was hallucinating? I didn't want to scare anyone. If I was pointing towards a piece of empty space and proclaiming that an invisible man was harassing me, then this flight was going to get really tense for everyone really fast. You can never rest when a maniac's in your midst. Yes, replied the stewardess. Oh, I blurted out. I didn't know whether to feel relieved or more worried. I had seriously considered that she might not be able to see him. Uh, well, he's been standing outside the bathroom since takeoff. I don't know if he's ill or if he's a special part of the crew or something. I don't know. But he hasn't sat down once since I boarded. He doesn't look well either. He looks worried and sickly and he hasn't been responsive. Is he, is he a part of the crew? No, replied the stewardess. Oh, uh, well... I mean, shouldn't we help him to his seat then, if we're about to land? He should be seated, right? I was sweating a little bit now, and more worried than before. None of this really made any sense. And where do you suggest we seat him, sir? Replied the stewardess firmly. What? I asked, genuinely shocked by the flippancy of her response. I turned around and looked for an empty seat. Surely there was one. How else could we have gotten on this plane? If he wasn't part of the crew, he needed a ticket. A ticket would have a seat. I frantically looked around. Every seat was filled. Every seat except for mine. I began to sweat profusely. I felt fevered and exhausted. A tingle of adrenaline rushed through my body. I looked up and out again at the mystery man. He stared back. I turned to the flight attendant. What do you mean? He doesn't have a seat? Did you check his ticket? How, how did you get on board? What, what's he going to do while we land? I became frantic. You could give him your seat, suggested the stewardess matter-of-factly. But... I mumbled. And where would I sit? She didn't respond. I looked helplessly at the other flight attendant, a steward. He said nothing. I felt like I was going to be sick to my stomach. I needed to sit down. I wondered who looked worse right now, me or the standing man. Should I, should I give him my seat? I looked up at him. Even from far away, I could see that he was looking gravely ill. No one was helping him. No one was helping either of us. I need to sit, I uttered. I felt like I was about to lose consciousness. It's you or him, I heard. Why? I whispered. There's only one seat left, someone said. And he's here for yours. My stomach dropped the full seven miles below my feet. My vision blurred. My body felt faint. I turned around back towards the mystery man. What the hell was going on? 
I tried to shout, but nothing came out. I grabbed the edges of the surrounding seats and pulled myself toward him. I needed to get back to my seat. I picked up steam and drew near, but still, he didn't move. Don't take my seat, I sputtered out. No one paid us any attention. I reached the last row almost on my knees. I gripped the top of a seat and pulled myself up. I stood for a second, facing down my row towards my empty seat, and then fainted sideways, directly into the standing man. I felt no contact until I hit the ground. My eyes were closed, but I felt the cold, hard fabric of the airplane carpet rub against my cheek. I laid there, exhausted, terrified. I mustered what strength I could, and I clumsily pushed myself up onto my knees. I kneeled for a second, turned away from the action and tried to catch my breath. I felt as heavy as a mountain slowly. I pushed my way back onto my feet, leaning against the cold plastic wall for support. I turned around, labored, and out of breath, and looked forward. The man was gone. I became frozen in fear. In the corner of my eye, I could see someone in my chair, with thin strands of pale brown hair thrown over his huge eyes, staring at me. In the distance, the aisle lights began to shut off, leaving only pure and eternal darkness in their wake. One by one, they clicked off as the darkness raced towards me until a final click enveloped everything in black. I woke on my back with a bright light shining in my face. Doctor? I heard a soft, distant voice ask. He's waking up. I tried to raise my left hand to shade my eyes, but it was weighed down by a thick tube, which slid from the side of my bed to a, to a mask on my mouth. I took a deep breath and felt an incredible soreness in my chest. I coughed. It hurt so much that I instinctively tried to retreat over the side of the bed. A firm hand grasped my shoulder and kept me in place. Easy now said a reassuring voice. You're going to be all right. I heard a door open. Someone gasped. Dad? A voice half whispered, half yelled. A child rushed over to the side of my bed, followed cautiously by a woman holding an infant. They all looked familiar. It was my family. He might not have the strength to speak right now, but the operation was successful explained a reassuring voice. He's got a new pair of lungs and a heart, all from the same donor. They were made available late last night and rushed over here just in time for an emergency surgery. Someone began to cry. They sounded grateful. I felt the warm weight of a child rest against my shoulder, and a loving hand grasped mine. I held both. With all of my strength, and dozed off contently. At Christmas, we had a recreation of what we had once thought was going to be my last meal roast beef and Yorkshire pudding. Everybody was invited. Extended family from all over the country poured into our home to celebrate. Longtime friends stopped by early in the evening on the way to family dinners of their own offer their congratulations, and express their joy and relief at my recovery. Near the end of the night, after all the memories and laughter had been given, their time and our bellies were full and people started to slowly drain out. I took my brothers and young son upstairs to my home office for our traditional Christmas time glass of bourbon. I poured each a cup as they looked fondly over the framed pictures that cluttered the room. That him? I heard. I looked up and directed my attention to a photo that was suspended just off to the right and just above the large family portrait that hung as a centerpiece on the wall across from my desk. Yeah, <laughs> that's our savior, I said, looking down at my baby boy asleep in my arms. I kissed his forehead and smiled gratefully. <laughs> well, cheers, declared my brother. Cheers, we all chanted, raising our glasses. And then... We had a drink for the men in the picture on my wall. A man who none of us had ever met. He smiled back gently from a boat somewhere out at sea, with his brown hair windswept to the side and a child, half in frame, sitting precariously on his lap. His face was filled with excitement and amusement. 
as he held up a significant-looking fish by the hook with his left hand. He could see the reflection of his wife taking the picture in his eyes. They were so big. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and thank you for watching today's video. And if you're on the podcast, then thank you for watching today's podcast. And if you're on uh, not the video or the podcast, then thank you for tuning into this telepathic broadcast. Oh, and there's something I need to mention to all of you. It's actually the big Halloween surprise. I mentioned this early on in the summer, but I never really got a chance to say what it was, because it wasn't really nailed down at the time. We, and by we, I mean me, Creeps McPasta, and Mew are going on tour across the United States in October. All the dates for it have been nailed down as of actually today, and tickets should be going on sale as of actually today. If you'd like to find out more, I'm going to have a bunch of information in the description down below all the way up until the tour is finished. But if you want to get a hold of your tickets, all the venues we've chosen have very limited seating, so make sure you get your tickets now if we're heading to a town near you. And one of the most exciting things about this is that I've been able to work with Mew across the United States doing conventions over the past couple of years. But this is the first time I think that Creeps McPasta is coming to the U.S. And it's especially the first time I'm going to be able to work with him live on stage. So this is going to be a show that's bigger than anything I've ever dreamed of being able to do in my entire YouTube career. So check it out down below at MarginWalkerPresents.com to get a hold of your tickets and come see us to celebrate Spooktober. Especially, I want to give a big thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys over at Patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta are the best. Especially, Trace Miles, Talon Karlick, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Wayne Milstead, Dr. Strawberry, Daniel Polson, Chumpinski, Ken Lando Higuchi, Rev Miroku, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Nicholas Said El Yassin, Buddy Burrows, Stephen Van Huss, Tristan Pelton, Goonington, G. Weevil 3, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Asia, Gabrielle DeBaca, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Titty Connoisseur, Melissa Swaygart, Kudir Max, Jay Kerbine, Dante Rao, Last Blade Song, Chris Wrights, The Gender Bros, Mads Beck Lorenzen Post, Don Mulmeister, Eliminator 86, Nebski, Andrew Stenberg, Jason Silsma, Steampunk Center, and Rafael Rodriguez. If you guys would like to join them, you can head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. And that's it for tonight. Sweet dreams, everyone. <laughs>